Right. Hey! What a great morning. Can you hear me okay? Is this thing really on? We on up there? Thanks. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, folks, I know we're, we're all excited and worried and anxious because in front of us is one of the greatest struggles uh, that we've ever seen in our country. And the country's divided. And people are on different teams. And we all know it's going to come down to two people. And we've all got to decide, is Peyton Manning going to win or Cam, Cam Newton? <laughs> That's what we've got to decide right now. <laughs> Being from Carolina, I don't know. I got to, Peyton, you know, to win one for the old guys, I, I kind of like that. Um, but the Carolina Panthers are kind of like, South Carolina Panthers, so I, I don't know, but anyway, but well, I, I, th I thought this morning was really inspiring, and I hope you saw a different side of conservatism. You know, sometimes, even after being there, I, and it seems worse from across the street, that I wonder if those guys have any sense at all who, who are in the Congress, but when, when you hear them come over and speak and talk about what we need to do, what we can do, uh, you see that these folks know what they're doing, they have the right ideas, and that, that conservative ideas are, are really compelling and inspiring. And the way they were presented today inspired me. What we were trying to show this morning is that this concept of conservatism, which is, really seeks to preserve those, that foundation of American strength, that we see that that has three pillars to it, three legs of the conservative stool, as, as we call it, which is a strong society, a strong economy, and a strong defense. And I know I've gotten myself in trouble before by saying uh, you really can't be an economic conservative unless you're a social conservative, and I've had a lot of folks jump on me to say that that, that wasn't right. But, folks, it is. Our, 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 a good economy is a derivative of a strong society and culture that, that has those values of, of free markets and hard work. Uh, and if, if you, your families disintegrate, if people don't have good educations, all those things that are part of the culture, you're not going to have a good economy. So I, really, I will restate today, I don't think you can be an economic conservative unless you understand the principles of a strong society. That's what we want you to see today. The kind of the themes and some of the policies of how you can build a strong culture and society that will lead to a, a strong free market economy that pulls millions of people out of poverty every year around the world. And then that economic strength gives you the capability to have the defense that you need to protect the greatest people in er on earth as well as support our allies around the world. And as we go on through the day with the, these policies, they, uh, look at them as all a fitting in. And into one of those legs, which often cross, they're all mutually uh, interdependent in, in, in a lot of ways. You're building all three at the same time. But that's what we want to fill in the blanks of how do you have a strong society, a strong uh, ec economy, a strong defense to make life better for every American. And what... I heard this morning was were not only uh, policy ideas, uh, green eye shade type stuff, but you heard, I think, the heart and the soul of conservative ideas. From all of those people who spoke, they talked about their own lives as real people, stories about other people, about our concern for poverty and how the left has left so many people trapped in poverty and that the, the hope that we talk about is much more real, much more true than anything the left can talk about. So I, I'm excited that you, not only you're seeing, but a lot of people who are following us online uh, are seeing a different side of conservatism, that side that people understand that bridge between the policies we talk about and a better life for them their, and their children and a stronger America in the future. So you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, from the panel. We've got some of the best and brightest from the House, uh, some of my best friends, some of the folks from House Freedom Caucus who have taken a stand against a strong headwind uh, and gotten a lot of grief for it. Um, but folks, for us to have champions on the inside who actually carry that banner for freedom is a way that we can inspire the whole country to get behind those ideas. 
Fred Barnes, who is a great conservative icon, uh, one of the founders of Weekly Standard, and, and continues to carry that banner himself, is going to help uh, moderate this panel. So, uh, you, folks, you c come on up and, and let's get the panel started. <clears throat> You're still taking a big step. <laughs> Guys. When they sit down, I'll, I'll see what order they're in so I can introduce them. But, uh, you know, you, uh, their, th their proper name is the Freedom, they're leaders of the Freedom Caucus. I think we all know them better as leaders of the Bomb Thrower Caucus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, and that's, I suspect, why, uh, why they, have, they have such a following around the country. Uh, bomb thrower number one here is, is Jim Jordan, who I bet many of you all don't know this. He, he, he's probably better known around the country as a great wrestler than he is uh, as a member of Congress. Now, maybe you've surpassed that as a member of Congress now, but, you know, he was a wrestler at the University of Wisconsin, and, and you've had one son there who's graduated, was a wrestler, and one there now, I think. That's right. Yep. Right, so uh, uh, keep that in mind when you disagree with him. Uh, <laughs> and then we have Mark Meadows, who uh, is a, uh, a congressman from North Carolina, who I think won a Democratic district uh, largely. Isn't that right? It was, uh, what was his name? He was a failed was quarterback sure. for the yeah. Redskins. Failed quarterback. Uh, <laughs> I think it was that district, right? Go Carolina Panthers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my son went to Auburn, so we're, we're cheering for uh, Cam Newton. Uh, 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 next, uh, Your son's a see, smart guy. Uh, uh, Mark, <laughs> Mark Mulvaney from South Carolina, Mick, who I have, uh, who, uh, um, what I say? Mark, that's okay. No big deal. It does say Mick. I, I, I knew that anyway. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. You know, the one thing I'm supposed to do is get the names right. <laughs> anyway, you know, I, I've interviewed him once, and I'll tell you why I went and interviewed him, and that is because my son, who works for the the uh, House Majority Leader, uh, Kevin McCarthy, said I ought to go interview him because he was so impressed by him. Uh, and I did. And I was pretty impressed too, I'll have to say. And then uh, last from Idaho, uh, <clears throat> Raul Labrador, uh, who has been involved in uh, uh, s some of, uh, of the touchiest issues. He's been very involved in the whole debate over immigration reform uh, and is one of the leaders in that. Uh, I don't think that's one of the things that's going to be worked on this year, but uh, it, it certainly will be uh, in the future, probably next year. Anyway, so this is our panel. Here's the drill. They're going to each talk for supposedly a couple of minutes, if you can believe that. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, then I'm going to ask them some questions, uh, and then you all will be able to ask them some questions. So, uh, uh, Congressman Jordan, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Fred. Uh, let me thank Heritage, and uh, specifically... Uh, Senator DeMint, you know, I, I say all the time, there are folks in politics who you wish weren't. Um, most of them are Democrats, but there, there's, some, there's some Republicans too, but there are guys like uh, Jim DeMint, who you are glad has been involved in public service and is now leading an organization uh, that has the standard of excellence that, that Heritage does. So thank you for having us. And the same thing applies, frankly, to the media. There are folks in the media who you wish weren't, uh, but Fred Barnes is one that you're glad is. Um, uh, there are, you know, the, the media is kind of strange. I've told my colleagues, uh, if the Washington Post and the New York Times aren't saying something bad about you, you're probably not doing anything good. Uh, you, ever listen, you, you ever read Cal Thomas? He's got a great line. He talks about normal folks and, and the way normal folks see things, the way the elite national press does. He says... Uh, Cal Thomas says, I get up every morning, I read my Bible and the New York Times so I can see what each side's up to. <laughs> so there's, 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 some, there's some truth to that. Um, look, Fred said two minutes, and I'm at like a minute 15 left. Uh, Dick Armey had an old line. He said, uh, he said when, when we act like us, we win. When we act like them, we lose. Uh, 2016, and the speaker's been very clear on this, and, 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 and conveying this, I think, in a very articulate and compelling manner. Uh, we need to demonstrate how we're different than Obama, Clinton, Sanders. I mean, it's just that simple. Uh, and there's a host of ways we can do that in a number of policy areas, and I'm sure we'll get into those uh, as, as we move through. But that Obama, Clinton, and you've got to now include Sanders based on the polling and what happened in Iowa and everything else, they want to take the country in a certain direction, want to continue to take the country in a certain direction. We think we need to go much different um, in big policy areas and, frankly, in reclaiming um, the constitutional role the, uh, the legislative branch has 
uh, from, from some of the things that have happened with this executive branch. It won't be easy, never is. Anything worth doing is hard, it's difficult, that's just the way the good Lord set it up. And sometimes you tick people off. Our job's not to do that. Our job's to be conservative and tell the truth with a smile on our face, just like Jim DeMint does. But sometimes you're going to tick people off. And I'll finish with this, because it's one of my favorite, favorite movies. Any of you ever seen 1776? Right? Great, great movie. Uh, set, of course, in Independence Hall. And the, the, the guys who started this wonderful dream and experiment we call America, this experiment, Liberty Got Together, Adams is the driving force behind drafting the declaration, which is going to declare to the world why it's appropriate to commit treason. Um, Jefferson's written the document. They're doing what we all do every day. They're marking it up now, right, what legislative bodies do. They're marking it up, and it's just one of those scenes you don't forget because Adams is impatient. He wants to get on with the vote and get on with this thing. The first member stands up and says, we need to change this paragraph because when King George sees this, this is just way too strong, and he's going to be offended, and we get it. Adams rolls his eyes, the next person stands up and says, and this section is going to be too strong because when Parliament reads this, we've got to have to change this sentence, and Adams is rolling his eyes. Finally, the third member stands up and says, we've got to get rid of this paragraph altogether because this could jeopardize our deep-sea fishing rights off the coast of New England. And Adams can't take it any longer, and he says, it's a revolution, damn it, we're going to have to offend somebody, right? <laughs> our job is not to offend. Our job is to present the truth in a compelling way, and 2016 is all about that. And... The House Freedom Caucus is committed to doing that, standing up for what we think the families around this country sent us here to do, and we're going to try to convey that in a, in a specific manner as we can in the course of this year. Thank you. So I'll be very brief. Thank you. So uh, took uh, all of our two minutes. Of our two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty close. That was, for, you, for you, that's really good. Yeah. That was a congressional two minutes. Uh, and so uh, uh, my, and so we'll... we'll but it's an honor not only to be. Yeah, uh, sure. I will be glad to. Uh, you're, you're a two-time national ra wrestling champion. I'll, of course, I'll you. Um, but but really, this this year is not about a presidential election. It's not really even about uh, members of Congress or senators who are up for re-election. It's about the American people, and we have got to get back in this country to we the people instead of we the lobbyist. And, uh, and when, when I say that, it is, it is a deficit of trust. Uh, the American people do not believe that anything is going to change in Washington, D.C. They know that we're headed in the wrong direction. They believe we need to make a U-turn, and yet what they constantly see is they send people to Washington, D.C. who drink the Kool-Aid and all of a sudden start to think like everyone else in D.C. instead of those on Main Street. And so uh, a number of us have made a commitment that our team is back home in the respective state in which we represent. You know, when you come up here, they want you to join the team and be part of the team, and you got to be a team player. And you'll hear that even on the national stage. We want everybody to get along and be part of a team. The problem is, is for me, my team is in western North Carolina. Uh, and, and when we start looking at putting together a team on K Street instead of a team on Main Street, we've got a problem. And so if we were, will remember our first love, and I'll close with this. Many of you, as I look out, can remember when you fell in love for that first time, and that first love was just unbelievable, and yet sometimes over the years, and I've been married 36 years, you, you forget about that first moment, and we must return back to that first moment as a nation and realize what is special and quit being ashamed of the greatness of this great country and start celebrating it. Thanks. Uh, that, uh, thanks, Mark. I, I couldn't do this without uh, first thanking uh, Senator DeMint. I'm from South Carolina, by the way. Uh, I'm also the first Republican in 130 years in my district. Despite what you hear about our state, we are conservative and not Republican. Um, and I couldn't have been in this spot without Senator DeMint. So uh, I just want to get a chance to thank him again for uh, helping me get here. And we've got a lot of, regardless of who you're with in the presidential race, uh, we've got a lot of good men and women running for office. Um, Marco Rubio is one. Ted Cruz is another. Rand Paul is another. Um, we wouldn't have any of those men in the Senate if it weren't for Senator well, DeMint. Yeah. So um, I think that uh, the work he's done... <laughs> 
I'm going to do a little bit different than my, my friends. The, I think the name of the seminar today is Changing the Game or something like that. I want to get rid into the weeds very briefly on what the game is. We are being asked right now uh, to vote for a budget. Uh, to vote for a budget at a level of spending that none of us support. In fact, a level of spending that between 90 and 150 Republicans have not supported in the last couple of months, depending on what sort of proxy you want to look at. We're being asked now to, to support that. The game is this, and the game that we need to change is this, is that that level of spending is not high enough for some Republicans and that some of them have figured out a way to spend even more. It's called the Overseas Contingency uh, uh, Operations Budget, the War Budget, and we're already hearing that that number that we're being asked for isn't high enough. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, what I think you're going to see, the game that you're going to see played, is that folks who want to spend more money will try to increase the war budget, and it will work. And we will pass a higher level of spending using the Overseas Contingency Operation off the floor of the House. Why? Because most people are afraid to vote against the Defense Department in the Republican Party. Most people are afraid to vote against the war budget. That's why we call it that. It makes it easy to spend money when you can park it in the OCO. By the way, the OCO is an off-budget line item. It does not count against the budget. It counts against the deficit, but not against the budget. We will pass it as Republicans because we're afraid to vote against it. Democrats are happy to see this because for every penny that we ask for for additional military spending, they will invariably ask for additional spending on the social side. And we will give it to them because we can't afford not to. Why do I say, no, that's the game that's going to take place in the next couple of weeks? Because it's what happened last year. It's what happened last year. It's how we ended up where we are right now at a number that not so many of us support. And until we figure out a way to change that game, until we figure out a way to change this idea of spending, 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 we get our spending, their spending is bad, but we want our spending, so we'll give them their spending so we can have our spending. Until we change that game, um, then the overall uh, environment of the place is not going to change. And like uh, Jim said, it's, uh, it's not easy to have a revolution. You will invariably upset people, uh, which is probably what's going to happen uh, with all of us in the next couple of days. So as we go through this today, I hope that Mr. Barnes gets a chance to talk a little bit about the budget process uh, because it drives a lot of the other things that are wrong uh, in that building in this town. Well, now that I'm totally depressed, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank Jim, and he's asked me a million times to call him Jim, so I'm going to call him Jim. I want to thank Jim for uh, his leadership in the Senate. I remember, you know, there's a few people that you know before you come to Congress and that you think to yourself, I hope he's as good in person as he is on TV, or I hope his principles are as, as good in real life as they are uh, on, in his speeches. And Jim is one of those few people that I have met in, in politics who actually you know, follows through on the principles and is the man that he portrays to be on TV. And I hope that someday somebody can say that about me as well. So I thank him for his leadership. But I think it's what he said is important in the beginning. He is absolutely right. If you're not a social conservative, you can't be a, a fiscal conservative. And why do I say that? Why am I a Republican? You know, I grew up in a single parent home in Puerto Rico. And my mom was a wonderful woman. She passed away 10 years ago. And she was a Democrat, and she loved the Kennedy family. But she also wanted me to have responsibility in my life. So she put me in school, private school. She put me in a military school. Then she put me in a bilingual school. And she wanted me to learn about being a better person, a better human being. And she knew that only through education, self-determination, through all those things, I would be able to be successful in life. And she told me certain things. She said, I want you to be married when you're older. I don't want you to have children out of wedlock. These things that she knew had sort of hurt her in her advancement, she wanted me to have in my life. She wanted me to believe in God, to believe in myself, to believe in my country. And she said she wanted me to make sure that I got an education, became successful, and then at some point in my life that I would be able to serve people like I had been served in my life. Those are the reasons that I became a Republican. In 1981, we moved from Puerto Rico to Las Vegas, and the first thing she did is she decided that she was going to register to vote. She had never voted for a president in her life in a general election, because in Puerto Rico you can't vote for president. It's not a state yet, maybe someday. And she decided as a lifelong Democrat 
that she would become a Republican. And why did she become a Republican? Because she believed in Ronald Reagan. And I'll leave you with this. She believed in Ronald Reagan because not just because of his vision, and we've heard Paul Ryan today talk about his vision, but she believed in Ronald Reagan because she trusted him. It wasn't just about saying the right things. It was about doing the right things. That's why the Freedom Caucus exists. We can't just be about saying the right things. We must do the right things or else the American people will never trust the Republican Party again. Anyway, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah. I think this is historic. I don't think four members of Congress has ever, have ever spoken so briefly <laughs> <laughs> at once. And let me ask a question about the budget, uh, uh, Mick. Uh, the, uh, uh, Thank you, Jim. No. <laughs> No, you, you talked about the game. The game would have, uh, I mean, you're stuck with a budget that's going to get bigger, but it was, the one, it, would, it was the one that John Boehner agreed to, mm -hmm. so it's sort of forced on Paul Ryan, mm -hmm. but don't you just wind up uh, where you wind up, uh, you wind up last year with the game, that you wind up with a, a huge uh, uh, budget, conglomerate budget, and, uh, and you all don't vote for it, uh, but some Republicans do, probably a minority, and all the Democrats, and... And that's it. That's I, the way the game ends. I think it's a way out. Um, and I hope that Paul, consider, uh, Speaker Ryan, considers this way out. Because I think Mr. Barnes is right, that if, if we don't do something dramatically different, we're going to end up with the same result. We're going to end up passing an omnibus or a CR at the end of the year with a small number of Republicans and a large number of Democrats, which is not good for anybody, um, most specifically Mr. Ryan. Uh, but there's a way to break that cycle, and that would be to simply pass a budget off of the floor now that's a good Republican budget. Yeah. Um, not going and say, look, we know that Mr. Boehner cut a deal at the spending levels that we did like and which we didn't vote for, um, but we're going to pass our budget. We're going to pass a budget that makes some sense. We're going to pass a budget that has a lot more fiscal discipline to it, also has all the policies that we like, but is a number that we can all rally behind and get a lot of Republicans to vote for. And if that, if that causes difficulties with the Senate down the road, so be it. But the House should pass what the House wants to pass. The House should not let the Senate dictate policy to us. Um, by the way, I had a lot of my, uh, my friends on the, in the center part of my party tell me, well, this is the law now. We have to support it. I'm like, yeah, so was the sequester. Yeah. Uh, you broke that one. So was Ryan Murray. You broke that one. So, I mean, that, that doesn't carry a lot of weight. We have a chance to break this cycle of simply spending more and more money every single year. But it takes something very difficult to do, which is to put a Republican budget on the floor and support it. Um, I'm hoping that's what we're able to do. You know, as, as fiscal conservatives, we tell the other side all the time that they need to look at their programs. Where are they wasting money? Where are they doing all these different things? And you think about this. Uh, you know, as the son of a single mom, I struggled through life. I had no money. I had nothing. I had to get scholarships to go to college, all those different things. I didn't have family money. So our party tells the poor, the needy, the single women that we're going to cut your programs but we're not going to look at military spending when there's budgets that are beyond what six other nations are combined. Now, some of you are going to disagree with Mick and I probably on the same page on this. We need to look at, if you're a true fiscal conservative, you're going to look at all the things. What are we doing in the Pentagon that is bloated? What are we doing in the Pentagon that we should actually cut? Are there too many generals in the Pentagon? And I think the answer is yes. So before we start talking about we need to add all this additional money to the Pentagon, maybe we need to practice what we preach, which is telling our side to look at our budgets, the things that are important, because I think we all agree at this day is that the most important thing we can do as members of Congress is fund the military. That's the most important thing that we can do because that's the defense of our nation. But if we're going to tell a single mother in Idaho that we're going to be cutting that program, we better be willing to tell the establishment in Washington, D.C. that is full of multi-billionaires that we're willing to look at the bloated budgets in the Pentagon and other areas. And that's how you can give more money to our men and women in the military that are actually fighting to save this nation. Yeah, I assume the other two agree with that. I'm going to go, <clears throat> I'm going to, go to another question. And I, it comes from... Uh, 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 something I was not here for uh, Paul Ryan's uh, speech this morning, but one of the great things when you're in journalism is they send you a text. <laughs> and I have it here, the text. And one of the criticisms you all have heard uh, probably more than any other of the Freedom Caucus is that you all are always trying to do things that are unachievable. 
Uh, and here's a, a, a sentence from, or two sentences from, from uh, uh, Paul Ryan's, uh, actually it is only, yeah, it is two. Okay, here's what he said. When voices in the conservative movement demand things that they know we can't achieve with a Democrat in the White House, all that does is depress our base and in turn help Democrats stay in the White House. We can't do that anymore. Congressman well, Meadows? Fred, uh, our history is sprinkled with things that were unachievable. When Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, nobody believed it would happen, and yet today we know that that wall does not exist. And so to suggest that things are unachievable, uh, you know, uh, this particular group got rid of uh, earmarks, uh, which said that we were going to always have earmarks uh, today because of some of the work that Senator DeMint and others did. We don't have earmarks. That was both impossible tasks. Do we have to be realistic with our expectations? I think the answer to that is yes. And so do we have to ignore the power and the voice of the will of the people? And, and I would say no to that. You know, when you have the will of the people and their voice behind you, it's amazing what you can accomplish in spite of Democrat, Republican, unaffiliated. So here's one of the ones, the value, when we talk about the, the budget and potentially, why don't we pass a very simple welfare reform bill that says the surfer dude actually has to get a job in order to get food stamps? I mean, what do you think about that? I, I mean, if you're an able-bodied adult with no dependent children, you have, should have a work requirement. They did it in Maine. They asked them to work only six hours a week. Six hours a week. They would provide transportation and go there. And you know what they found out in Maine? 75% of them didn't want to even show up for six hours, so they went off of the food stamp rolls. I think we need to do that as a federal government. Uh, don't you think it's time that we make the super dude get a job? <laughs> I would just I would give you just one quick example. The omnibus, the big spending uh, legislation that took place at the end of the last uh, calendar year. Our group went to uh, our leadership and we asked for a couple simple things. We said, do something on the pro-life issue. We, after all, we had this organization that's get your tax dollars, do all kinds of disgusting things. We said, it doesn't have to be defund them completely. Let's just figure out something we can do that's going to protect the sanctity of life s somewhat more. And then we said, pass put in the omnibus the exact same legislation that dealt with the refugee issue, which Americans are rightly concerned about, the Syrian refugee issue, take that bill that passed separately in the House with 47 Democrats supporting it, actually a veto-proof margin, take that legislation, put it on the omnibus, and send that to the Senate. We know the President said he would veto it, but let's see if he really would in light of the fact that 47 members of his own party did it. So this idea that we can't do something, quote, reasonable, that, that, that's con entirely consistent with where, as Mark was pointing out, where the American people are. That's what we said, put that in the omnibus, and maybe we can then live with the higher spending number if we're actually accomplishing things that are good for the American people, good for our national security. So we've done those kind of specific things where the conservative group that can never get to yes, we've taken, here's a way to get to yes, and we think this makes complete sense, good politics, everything but unfortunately was not, not put in the bill. Oh, you you know, know, I'm sorry, go ahead. You know, I understand what Paul is saying or trying to say, uh, but, but let's look at the reality. You have the Republican Party on one hand is saying, be realistic, which I think we should be, but don't engage in fights that you can't win. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, is telling their voters, we're going to do the things that you want, you, you want us to do. You, you have right now a socialist telling his party that he's going to give them free health care, he's going to give them free education, he's going to give them all these things. No one is telling him, hey, you need to be a little bit more realistic about your goals. And he's the most popular person in the Democratic Party right now. So our leadership is telling us to be realistic, and it's through realism that we're going to win national elections. Well, guess what? We were realistic in 2012. And with all due respect, not only did we win, lose the presidency, we lost the Senate. And I don't know if you guys know this, but we lost the House. How many of you know that we lost the House in 2012? We didn't lose the seats, but we lost the national vote by one over one million votes. You want to lose 
then become realistic and not aspirational about the things that we can accomplish and we're willing to do together. Yeah. Well, let me ask you again about uh, Speaker Ryan. I happened to interview him a couple of days ago for an hour, and he talked particularly about his agenda, which he wants to be the Republican agenda, to actually pass bills on these five issues, national security, the economy, uh, the Constitution, poverty, and health care. wants to pass an alternative to Obamacare before uh, the Republicans actually nominate a presidential uh, uh, candidate who may have thoughts of his own. But anyway, there will be bills on all these things. Uh, is that a good idea? He talks about the party uh, being propositional rather than just oppositional. I think it's a great Jim? idea. Uh, and we're, we're uh, entirely supportive of that. Frankly, we think it should be as specific as it possibly can, an actual legislation that we bring to the House floor and pass and send to the Senate. Uh, Mark is exactly right. Uh, able-bodied adults, able-bodied single men who surf in the day and play in a rock band at night shouldn't be getting your tax dollars. So we need to reform welfare and emphasize work. We need a tax code that the tax code's a mess. You all know it. I've said a bazillion times, any tax code that says to people on the personal side, you don't have to participate in the main tax is broken. It says to half the people, you don't have to participate, is broken. Any tax code on the corporate side which says to American companies, you're going to pay the highest rate in the world is stupid. So if you have a tax code that's broken and stupid, you might want to change it, right? <laughs> So we all know that. So let's, let's not just talk about it. Let's actually put together a bill that goes to a flat tax or a hybrid. You know, let's do it. And the same thing applies to health care. The same thing applies to national security and border security, this refugee issue. And then, of course, as we've talked about, reclaiming the rightful constitutional uh, prerogatives of the, of the uh, legislative branch. Any others? Well, we, we agree with Paul 100% on the agenda. Mm -hmm. We think that that's the right idea. But I go back to my opening remarks. Remember why people voted for Reagan. They did, he didn't just have the right vision. They trusted that he was going to implement the right vision. The American people right now do not trust Republicans in Congress mm -hmm. to implement the right vision. And that's why we created this group, because we want the American people to know that we are standing with them. Think about the election, the, the uh, caucus in Iowa, Sig over 60 3% of the people voted for an outsider. It was closer to 66%, I think, uh, voted for an outsider because they are fed up with what's happening in Washington, D.C. They're fed up with the Republican Party. And we need to wake up to that reality. If we don't wake up to that reality, we're not going to be able to do any of these beautiful things that Paul is talking about. You know, one of the – I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just say, has anybody here been to a Trump rally? Yes. I went. I may be the only member of Congress who's gone. Um, <laughs> You should go. If you uh, Jeff chance. Sessions has been to a number of them. Yeah, go. Um, it'll, I, I went mostly to see who was there. Uh, I thought it would be the two. I didn't think crowd. they would let you in yeah, for security yeah. purposes. <laughs> they, they wouldn't let them near Trump. It was the folks who work <laughs> at the local bank. It was uh, off-duty law enforcement. It was the guys who work at the paper mill in my district. Union, by the way. Um, that's who's going there. That that that. This is supposed to be our base. No offense intended, the people in this room are probably not our base. They're an important part of the party, uh, but there's not enough of this group to win elections. We need those people in order to start winning, um, and they don't believe anything we say right now. In fact, the speech that Donald Trump gave was aspirational. It was energetic, certainly, and it was positive. There was only two groups that he attacked in the entire speech, politicians and the media. That's where we are right now in the, in this, in the stratus of things. It's the, it's the New York Times and members of Congress. They hate all of us. Um, and until we figure out why, by the way, George Will spoke at, the, uh, at, our, at our retreat a couple weeks ago. And I, I, my version of his, of his, uh, his speech, he'll, he'll, he'll contest this, was that if you want to know, members of Congress, why you have Donald Trump, go look in the mirror. Yeah. Because we've overpromised and underdelivered for so long. We have failed to deliver on these, uh, on these promises that we've created Donald Trump. Um, so until we figure that out, and uh, you talk about changing the game, what Paul is talking about is, this, is business as usual. And business as usual has gotten us where we are, which is not in a very good, uh, good spot when it comes to winning national elections. And that's the game we have to change. I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, I'll go to the audience here. And my question deals with the Senate and Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell. I asked uh, Paul Ryan when I interviewed him, uh, a few days ago, well, what about you have this plan, you have these five issues, you're going to pass bills on these, and, and, uh, and, 
and then what happens? Uh, what about the Senate? Uh, have you made arrangements with the Senate? Do they like this idea of passing all these things now? And, and I can't remember exactly what the response was by Paul Ryan because it was so fuzzy. <laughs> it, it was no. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what about the Senate? Yeah, obviously, the, the Senate gets uh, blamed for a lot of things, and they should. Uh, uh, and the, I think the most telling thing the other day is Senator Tom Cotton came back over to the House and is a dear friend of, of a number of us, I think everybody here. And we had a series of votes, Fred, at that particular point where we were going through, and it was about 12 votes. He says, now you've voted more today than we have in the last six months. Therein is the problem. The American people are tired of members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, not working as much as they should, you know, and, and truly passing things. And so we somehow want to block and tackle and not have people take difficult votes. Uh, and, and we need to take difficult votes, and, and we need to pay the consequences for those times when we're against our constituency and be sent home. Is it realistic to believe that they're going to roll over and say, we're with you 100 percent, Fred? The answer is no, but I also believe that if we worry about what the Senate does, we're not truly representing the House's uh, initiatives. A uh, good friend of ours, Morgan Griffith, reminded us it used to be illegal to even mention the Senate on the House floor. Today, what we're doing is, is we're doing these super deals, much of them made by staffers, not by elected members of the Senate or Congress, to come together with a super deal that we roll out and try to convince everybody to do. It's time that we allow the the will of the people to work its will and get back to that. Very good. I'm going to go to questions and uh, identify yourself and then uh, uh, deliver, if it's uh, possible, a very succinct question. Yes, sir. In light of what, in light of what, what you just said, is anybody in the House pushing Senator McConnell, other members of the Senate, to change the Senate rules to abolish filibusters, because it seems to me... Now, that, that's the end of the question. Until Good. you do yeah. that, nothings, you're not getting anywhere. Anyone have, have thoughts about the filibuster? Yeah, we've, uh, we've talked about it. We've talked about it with Speaker Ryan. Actually talked about it with Mr. McConnell, who came to our retreat. We had a really good conversation with Mike Lee, a man for whom I have a great deal of respect. And I wish that Senator DeMint were still here. Um, there's actually some folks who, who, who I think very highly of who don't want us to change the filibuster rule. I respect that position, but disagree with it. I do believe that the minority should have protections in the Senate, but I believe you can afford those protections by simply requiring them to speak their filibuster and not do it by notice anymore. There's ways to do this. The, the uh, filibuster rule, by the way, is not constitutional. It's not even that old. It's only about 40 years old, um, the way we have it today. So there are ways to do it. And we continue to press. One of the things we, we've talked about with Paul on this budget process is he says, well, we have this commitment that the Senate is going to do an appropriations process this year. We heard the exact same thing under Ryan Murray three or four years ago. Does anybody know how many appropriations bills Congress has passed since January of 2011? Zero, not a one. Uh, we've not sent a single appropriations bill to the president's desk in five years. So until the Senate proves to us that they're willing to work, um, there's very li little reason to do exactly what Mark just said, which is cut deals with them. Why would you cut deals with people who can't follow through on them? Uh, so yeah, we do press it. Uh, unfortunately, we, we sort of can't get um, our leadership yet to buy into it. I, I think that one of the reasons that uh, Mr. Boehner had to leave was he failed to defend the House as a co-equal branch of government. Um, and I do hope that the new leadership team we have in place uh, does start defending the House against the Senate. We should pass our own budget out of our own committee. We should pass it off the floor and send it to the Senate, let them do their work and, and push them in that way. But uh, yes, as the answer to your question, it's just not been very fruitful yet. Okay, next question. A, a very brief <laughs> question. Brevity is my specialty. You know that, Mr. Burns. Um, let's talk about this go along to get along type of leadership that we had so that if you don't, uh, go along, you get punished by leadership with your own party, and and you guys get punished a lot for. So, some people deserve it, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> I blasted Twitter like you wouldn't believe. That, that, that's a good question. Okay, Thank you. Uh, I can tell you, that Speaker Ryan, uh, that is is entirely different. 
Okay, yes. and, and so I, I want to make sure that the American people hear that. This is a new day, and yep. in spite of what you may think or not think of the speaker, it is a new day as it relates to that, and I can tell you from someone who has experienced uh, just a little bit of uh, retribution uh, that it is a new day. I trust him completely in that, and, and it's not just him. He's, he's passed the word. So. Somebody help here, please. Okay. okay. In the back. Yes, sir. Mine's a suggestion. I'm a district captain for conventionofstates.com in St. Louis. And, um, you know, that's Article 5, amendments to the Constitution, bring, bring amendments one at a time. Mark Levin's one of its champions, Michael Ferris. I'm going to suggest to you all that it's leverage. What you need is leverage, and it's leveraged for you. If you would talk about it, embrace it, and bring it up. Yep. And yeah. one of the great things it would do is, is cause the Senate to report back to the state legislatures, which is a hundred, which is one of Woodrow Wilson's first strategies. So, okay, so what do you guys good. think about embracing very that? Very good. I think they all know what a, a constitutional convention would be. Anybody in favor of it? Look, look, when, when okay. the, now, the, the, the convention of the state, yeah, yeah, the founders wrote the document. They, they said there may come a day where things are in such a mess, namely $19 trillion debt. CBO report two weeks ago says this year's deficit is going to increase by $105 billion. Maybe that's a situation that warrants using the tools that the founders put in the Constitution to begin to address that. So I am certainly open to that. i got a buddy back home and former state legislator who's doing it, working on it in Ohio. So I think it makes a lot of sense. I am a little bit skeptical uh, about the convention. I'll tell you why. And I've read Mark Levin's book. I respect everything that he said about it. My concern is if you look at the power of special interests in, in politics, what you will get at a, but this is my concern, is that what you'll get at a uh, convention of states is special interests deciding what the Constitution should say. Uh, you have a lot of state legislators that are running these and doing a lot of things. So I'm really worried. I know there's an argument that that's not going to happen. And I don't mean to get into a debate. I'm just uh, answering your question. Uh, I have seen the power of special interests in state legislatures as a state legislator, and I've seen it here in Congress. And I really fear that what's going to happen is just a few people are going to have a lot of power in those conventions, and it's going to be very difficult to not change the Constitution in a way that is difficult. I'm not trying to get into the debate. Raul may be right, and that's a, that's a very valid concern, and one I think everyone in this room shares, mm -hmm. but the question is real simple. you got to balance that with the situation yeah. we find ourselves in, yeah. and it's a judgment call, mm -hmm. and the founders set the Constitution up for that very situation. We'll have to, we, the people, will have to decide, but... You know, and that, but, but we've laid out the two arguments. I get it. Anybody who supports it has to realize, though, that there's a really good chance that while we think we're the ones who are going to drive the debate at the convention, that's not necessarily true. Exactly. Yes, sir. <clears throat> oh, hi, I'm Bob Carlstrom. Just to follow up on the on the filibuster question, because when you passed a lot of good bills, which you did this last year and before, but they're headed off at the pass because of the the Reed Durbin McConnell dynamic. Does that back up on you guys in terms of your reputation when you go back home and you have to explain to them, well, we did all these good things, but it didn't. It went for naught. Because I think it really hurts hurts us as Republicans uh, as a do nothing Congress because we're blocked by this rule that frustrates the Senate from doing its constitutional duty? Yeah, good question. Uh, it, it does hurt when you go back. I mean, obviously, credibility, when you look at our approval rating being less than a cockroach, it's, you know, it, it, uh, I think it would, it's self-evident. But uh, I think the other part of that is, is looking at modifying it. And, and uh, Mick mentioned Senator Mike Lee, who I thought would be all about doing away with it made a very compelling case why we shouldn't, you know, per perhaps a hybrid where we look at appropriations bills so we don't have this uh, blocking uh, necessarily right now w with the appropriations process because we've, we've got to get back to a point where we do that. In the back. George White, Winchester, Virginia. Say something about, uh, and two, those angry folks that ha their spending power is the same now as it was 30 years ago, and where are the new jobs going to come from that we're talking about uh, getting rid of, of, of 
federal jobs and public jobs and just say something about how the economy is going to support a whole lot of new jobs for all the people we, we say, uh, surf dude, go get a job. Yeah, yeah thank you. Presumably, uh, uh, this new bill uh, dealing with the economy and jobs uh, is going to deal with that, right? Yeah, I, I think the real key is is that there are billions and trillions of dollars being invested every day. The question is, where is it being invested? And, and with, the, with the lack of having a, a tax structure mm -hmm. that incentivizes people to invest here, they're investing in other places. You know, when you have a corporate tax rate in Ireland that is, uh, you know, less than half of what ours is, and they speak uh, probably English better than some of us do, uh, you know, they, the, the investment goes there. So we, we've got to make it an incentive once again to bring manufacturing here, just not service jobs, but bring manufacturing, high-tech, advanced manufacturing. Part of that is, is really comprehensive tax reform. Yeah, I mean, for 200-some for years, corporations wanted to headquarter in the United States. Got seven years of Obama, and we got this thing called this phenomenon called inversion, and they want to go elsewhere. It's driven largely by tax policy, but also regulatory policy, also healthcare policy. So all that has to happen. But but to, when you cut to the chase, and this is one of the reasons we, as Raul said earlier, we formed the organization. We think there are countless number of middle class families who feel like this town has completely forgotten them. Our job is to remember them and fight for them, and, plain and, and simple. And that and you do that through policy. You do that through all kinds of all, all kinds of things we do in, in, in hearings and everything else. But um, that's our focus. But yeah, this, this, this phenomenon is, is real, and we have to change some key policies. And let me jump on the back side. It's not wages. The most illuminating thing was Paul Broyhill of Broyhill Furniture shared with me why so many jobs left and went to China. I said, well, it was because of cheaper wages. He said, no, out of every dollar of cost, only 23 cents of that went to wages. The rest of it was regulatory compliance, taxes, and other issues that they have to face as an American business owner. So we can pay higher wages because of the advantage of cheaper fuel costs cost here if we get rid of some of the regulations and, and tax burden that are out there and create jobs and allow investment to come back. There's another aspect I think that doesn't get much broad discussion because it's, it's fairly technical and it, uh, sort of hard to get your hands around, which is the role of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Um, that if you, the way I explain it to people is if you're working for $15 an hour, um, there is a group in Washington, D.C. that we don't elect that actually dictates how much that dollar is worth and you don't pay any attention to it. I can assure you, if instead of changing the value of the dollar, they changed the value of the hour and said you now have to work 62 minutes in order to get that hour's worth of work, you'd, you'd be up in arms. And that's, that's effectively what the Fed has done. And I think that uh, if, we need, if we're talking about a comprehensive economic policy, we should be looking at federal reform, uh, Fed re uh, Reserve reform as well. Yeah, well. Okay, one more question. Yeah, you right there. You're the only one under, under 60 who's going to ask one. <laughs> Oh, wait a second now. Oh, Hold on house, a second, Fred. Oh. oh, come on. Every woman hey. in the audience is now upset with Fred Morris. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. As they should be. Right. Yeah. Hey. No, Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Brock Waltarski. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington. I'm recently going to be graduating with my master's. Uh, one of the biggest uh, problems with people our age is the national debt continues to go up and our futures are looking less and less optimistic. So what can you do to help us get those legendary things called jobs and Social Security when we get to that age? <laughs> Don't count on Social Security yeah. when you get there. No. <laughs> no, and I'd say that in yeah. jest. I mean, actually, Social Security is easier to fix than Medicare. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we can work with that if we just have the will to work with it mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and deal with that. Medicare is probably a bigger problem. But, but the jobs things actually comes back to really we, we have to fundamentally uh, look at uh, getting D.C. out of the way of job creation instead of expecting it to create jobs. And so when we do that, I, I think that'll do it. But I want to refer to my economic guru, uh, Mr. Mulvaney. What did you study? Seriously, what did you study? U.S. history. Okay. That's did you, the problem. Did no. you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. That's the problem. No, it's not the problem. Look. When we were... When, uh, <laughs> better, better than political science, right? <laughs> When we were younger, and you had to go get student loans, what you had to do is you had to go to your bank. And you know, you'd ask them to lend you money so you'd go to school. They ask you what was probably a fairly reasonable question, which is, can you pay it back? <laughs> and you started thinking about that. Now you go to the government to get your student loans. It doesn't make a difference. We'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. It's one of the largest wealth transfers, by the way, in history, is the wealth transfer to the higher education because of the way we've reformed uh, student loan process. So we, we've sort of taken the market 
out of that analysis. And this is not to, not to denigrate or demean folks who want to study philosophy or US history or anything. I mean, there, there's a certain value in higher learning. I will not, but my, my, my sister teaches drama for crying out loud, but there's a value to it. There's no question. But you need to sort of consider the job prospects when you're making those decisions. And if that's not that important to you, you want to go study something like uh, Sub-Saharan African basket weaving, that's great. And you'd be a better person for it, but don't come looking at us and say, where are the jobs for Sub-Saharan basket weavers? Um, so we need to put the market back into that consideration um, and allow you to make your own decisions for yourselves as allowed to let everybody else in this room make decisions for you, which is what's happening right now. I, I went to University of Washington Law School, so I lived in Seattle for a while. Uh, and I studied in undergrad in, at BYU, and I studied philosophy and Latin American history, which is really valuable uh, <laughs> for, you know, for this uh, economy today. Uh, so hence, I decided to go to law school, so I could at least get, get a job after graduating from graduate school. Um, but, but you have to look, I, I agree with you, that debt is the most crushing thing to, to people your age. And when you start thinking about not just people your age, but people who actually work are going to owe probably three times as much as the people who, who don't work, because the people who work are the ones who are going to pay back the debt. I always go back to this line, and everybody's heard it a million times, but there's a reason why Admiral Mike Mullen said that the biggest national security threat to our nation is our debt. Republicans have not understood that. It's one of the reasons that we talked about the military budget and all these other things. If we don't control the debt, if we don't do something about stopping the debt from increasing another $10 trillion over the next 10 years, we're not going to have enough money for our military. We're not going to have any money for national defense. We're not going to have any money for border security, any of those things because all of our money is going to be going to entitlement programs and paying the debt. And imagine what happens if all of a sudden we increase the, 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 the interest rate actually goes up. We're going to be crushed as a nation. There is a reason why Mike Mullen said what he said is because he knew what had happened to the great nations in history, that it wasn't they weren't defeated by military might, they were defeated but they, because they couldn't afford to defend themselves. And that's my biggest fear, and that's why I continue to advocate for real fiscal conservatism in Washington, D.C. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks thank to you, the Brent. panel. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you all.